Order, end of question time. The clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Item 1, resumption of debate on the President's address. The question is that the following address in reply to the speech of the President be agreed to. We, the Parliament of the Republic of Singapore, express our thanks to the President for the speech which she delivered on behalf of the Government at the opening of the second session of this Parliament. Mr. Sia Kemping. Mr. Speaker, sir, the call for bold ideas by the President has received widespread response. In a sense, this is not surprising. Good ideas are the product of long reflection and examination. But they are also sometimes a result of an urgent felt need, some local knowledge from ground experience, or even strong emotional response. As you have seen in the past few days, bold ideas are not in short supply, but sieving them through the good from the not-so-practical or reckless ones, the strong from the popular and perhaps even more difficult ones, implementing these ideas, if not flawlessly, then at least successfully, these are far more difficult. It is far easier to write a policy paper than to actually make a policy happen. I say this not to belittle the role of bold ideas, but to argue their limitations. We ought not to let ideas be our masters, but think more deeply about their weight and impact. That is, we should worry less about why we do than why we do them. Today, Mr. Speaker, sir, I argue one simple idea, which is to rethink the way we evaluate ideas. We need to rethink the role of the market and of economic reasoning. For a long time, the economic reasoning that our government applied to public policies, they have stood us in good state, whether in health care, in housing, or in the management of much of our social policy, such reasoning has allowed us to make good use of our resources. The magic words in any policy was whether it was sustainable, that is, whether it would pay for itself. Long-term reliance on government funding is sometimes the kiss of death for a good idea. For if the idea was good, surely money can be found from the market. But economic reasoning is empty without a moral foundation. Such foundations cannot and do not exist without a conversation about values. Not just what is cheap, but what is right. Not just about generating income, but about giving meaning. For too long, we have made decisions based more on an economic compass, as if the use of one dollar has the moral equivalence of the loss of another. So it is time we recognize that money is merely a proxy for value and at times a very bad one. We need regulations on responsible use of funds, on fiscal prudence, good procurement, but equally, we ought to be having a conversation about reciprocity, trust, and relationships. Teachers know this. They know the magic of little gestures, of a sticker with a thumbs up stuck on the untidy worksheet for encouragement. For a little child who handed in his homework despite family difficulties, a treat of a small snack, a lift to a school to a pupil who otherwise would not make one to come. Teachers who have all these years paid for all forms of children's day treats and surprises for children, all these things which cost them no small amount of money and yet whose value transcends price. Teachers who have bought their own red pens to mark the test papers of all our children, they do not think the MOE doesn't pay for red pens. Let me use instead the whiteboard markers, which they do pay for. They don't think I should means test the kids and give treats only to those who cannot afford it. It is laughable and an insult to think that they do this in exchange for free parking. So of course the withdrawal of free parking would not make teachers any less likely to do the many incredible and price things they do. Rather, it is a reciprocity and a give and take, which I feel we have lost by insisting on this strict calculus of benefits. Using a clean wage argument implies that all the years of free parking had tarred teachers with an unclean wage. So I do not want to belabor parking any further. Teachers, I think, have accepted this and they have moved on. 
but something still sits uncomfortably on this matter for me. And I want to address this squarely. Not all government policy has a complete recourse to dollars and cents. We need, within our current structures, make more room from the lexicon of morality, duty, relationships and trust. This is not an appeal to populism, rather it is an appeal to the ideas of justice and community that have informed Singapore public policy making at the start of our journey 53 years ago. The first practical implement implementation of my idea, this reform must start at the Ministry of Finance, responsible for so many of our policy levers, a reform that requires an explicit recognition of the limits of price, cost and expenditure as a proxy for value, and to allow for greater use of discretion by public officers in recognizing moral reasoning as a legitimate form of argumentation. So I use the decision to charge parking to illustrate the kinds of conversation that we ought to be having. Thinking about the issue using a pure economic lens is, I argue, a mistake, as is the reduction of clean rich. Surely a moral idea to a mere tableau of taxable benefits. Without this lexicon, we will not be able to address the greatest problems that, we, that have arisen in our time. The current debate has framed it as a problem of inequality, but that risks mere description without a thesis. We might better frame it as a problem of an overweening dominance of economic magical thinking, a problem which again could be addressed by recalibrating the balance between the economics and the morality of our public actions. So many have spoken about the need for equality, but we have spoken mainly within the current framework of providing everyone with equal opportunities. While it is true that inequality is lower today than at the start of Singapore's journey, we also worry that stratification today is higher than it was in the past, a point which Minister Ong Yi Kang highlighted in his speech on Wednesday. And so our measures must be correspondingly more aggressive and we must slant inequality the other way. John Rawls famously said that we must try our best to treat people as equally as possible, and any inequality ought to be to the benefit of the least advantage. But today, where inequality exists, we must go further. And in a country where socialism is not a dirty word, but a founding philosophy, we must be prepared to do more for equal. And so I suggest that we must increasingly and continually treat people as unequally as practicable, so as to provide the largest advantages to the disadvantaged. We must make sure that a boy born to poor parents must have come, must have more from the state than one born from the rich. I've said before in this house that this compensates for such matters as luck in birth and circumstance, and I still hold the view even more strongly today. In the past, it used to be a degree was a tried and tested way to climb the, corporate, the ladder. Today, more and more of us, ministers included, have said that a degree is not the only way. In the US, the higher education premium has not increased for the past 10 years. But here's the rub. When the premium on higher education falls, it is replaced by more varied paths and decision-making always levies a higher cognitive tax on the poor. We must make sure that the transition to the new economic structure benefits the least advantage in our society. And at the same time, I know that we need to be sensitive to the accusations of unfairness. That it is unfair that the people who pay taxes get the least out of the system. That Singapore ought to be a country for all, rather than always take from one side and giving to the other. And yet this is the truth of a nation. Those who have more bear a larger burden. It is how we tie to each other as Singaporeans, confident that whoever falls upon hard times, rich or poor, they will have a helping hand. This is our only safety net against fate and bad luck, whether in bad health or accidents. Incidentally, this also includes many external events outside our control. Economic storms can wipe out fortunes, making the rich today the destitutes tomorrow. Hence, my second suggestion to re for reform we need more aggressively progressive policies to ask more from the rich and lessen the burden on the poor. All in the recognition that in the view of ignorance, luck and chance attend to all men and women and all Singaporeans need to stick together 
through thick and thin. I do not mean this to say that we need a minimum wage or universal welfare. Quite the opposite. We need a partnership, a partnership of all Singaporeans for deeper engagement with Singaporeans with different needs, to negotiate paths to the complexity of our interests. Mr. Speaker, the rebalancing of economic re moral reasoning also leads us to see the injustice that we continue to be complicit in by using up environmental capital meant for future generations. So you see that Singapore is changing. Temperatures are getting more extreme. And within the past few months alone, I think we've seen unusually cool and unusually warm days. This is a significant problem and not one that we can solve alone. But we can certainly make a start, for example, in changing the way we live and spend resources, in making changes to our diet for one and for energy consumption for another. We need to make sure that the capital that we rely on today still remains for the needs of tomorrow. In this, we require both morality and economics to work together for capital to power clean technology for the future as well as a massive change in consumer behaviour today. So my third and final idea for reform, let us start an environmental behaviourable change lab that will tackle the largest environmental problems for our times. To lower our carbon emissions, create our energy efficiency and allow Singapore to impact the world by making it bluer, greener and less polluted. This is an issue which remains underinvested today, especially in the social sciences and I urge the government to invest in a research fund on environmental behaviour and change. So Mr Speaker, sir, mine is a simple idea. We need to insert and steer our values into the national conversation about prosperity and growth. We need to balance the economic reasoning with moral reasoning. We need to make what is cheap, efficient and quick to what is fair, just and right. It may be that there is no one policy, no matter how bold, that will address the most pressing problems for our times. It may be that Singapore today is a problem for the foxes rather than hedgehogs. But we need first to recognize that foxes speak the multi tonal language of values rather than the universal language of money. We must therefore make language of morality our vernacular in policy matters. So I support the motion.